When I first started playing home video games, I gravitated almost exclusively towards arcade ports and arcade-style games. Lots of shoot-'em-ups, running guns, things of that nature. But as time went on, I became acutely aware that a game could be great no matter the genre or subject matter. When Capcom released DuckTales in 1989, I was also taught a fine lesson in not brushing off an IP in gaming just because you didn't care for it elsewhere. I had no great love for Disney characters. Hell, growing up, I was all about Voltron, Defender of the Universe, and the many adventures of Optimus Prime in the Transformers. But that game was so much more than I ever would have given it credit for otherwise. When Sega launched its Genesis, they mainly pimped the sports and arcade games, so I of course was all in for that campaign. I always tried to give any game a real chance though, so when Sega released Castle of Illusion starring Mickey Mouse, you can imagine my shock when a good friend began singing its praises. I was skeptical, but when I finally got my hands on it, wow, what a surprise. I genuinely fell in love with it and found it quite the solid platformer. In this episode, we will take a look at the 16-bit version of Castle of Illusion and break down why it's such a great game. Castle of Illusion originally was released at the very end of 1990 in both Japan and North America, with other regions getting it in early 1991. It was developed internally at Sega R&D 2, which was later rebadged as Sega CS and responsible for a ton of the most popular games across the SG-1000, Master System, and Genesis. The main game designer was Emiko Yamamoto, who was also part of nearly every decent Disney game Sega made back then including the 8-bit Castle of Illusion, Quackshot, World of Illusion, Land of Illusion, and Deep Duck Trouble. The story starts out like most tales of this nature. A couple of happy people are minding their own business when some miserable spoiler of fun has to make sure to ruin it for everybody. The evil witch Miserabelle has kidnapped Minnie, and Mickey must conquer the Castle of Illusion to get her back. It's gonna be no easy task, however, because you must first collect the seven gems of the rainbow in order to unlock the final path. The gameplay is straight up action platforming. Nothing difficult to explain or come to terms with after only a few moments of playing. Mickey can jump and use his butt bounce to kill enemies or throw apples at them from a distance. Apples are collected like ammunition during the stages you play, and there are plenty of things scattered about for target practice. There are five main stages, which then have sub-levels before you make it to a boss character. Like the regular enemies, you must jump on or throw apples at them to gain victory. There is typically a theme to each stage. In the first, you'll make your way across the Enchanted Forest. In the second, Toyland, so on and so forth. While initially it looks like it would play exactly like Super Mario, it actually plays a bit differently. Instead of just jumping on an enemy to defeat it, you actually must jump and then hit the jump again to activate the butt bounce, so timing becomes quite important. Aside from taking out enemies, it can also give you a much needed boost to get to higher platforms, or get you across longer jumps. As you defeat each area, you'll collect a new gem and move on to a different room in the castle. Once you collect all the gems, a path opens up to your final confrontation. For a 4 megabit cartridge, Castle of Illusion here is just gorgeous. Aside from the appealing art of the IP itself, the color and animation do early 16-bit games quite proud. There is a great variety in the locations and enemies you face, again impressive for such a small cartridge. When my friend lent this game to me and I dropped it into my Genesis, I was blown away. I mean, the Genesis had been impressing me already with stuff like Revenge of Shinobi and ESWAT, but Castle of Illusion was out of left field with its lush environments and whimsical enemies. It's not overly cartoonish either, which I quite liked. There is a tone of gritty realism to the art, and it's enhanced by the color palette the developers chose. It really was a great match, and the end result was one of 1990's better-looking games. While later Disney games would come along and put up some impressive visuals themselves, I still gotta give credit where credit is due. Castle of Illusion was one nice-looking Genesis title. Yeah. 
The sound and music are best described as suitable. Nothing here will blow you away or be featured in a Best Music of the Genesis episode. But what it lacks in overall execution, it certainly makes up for in feeling like it belongs here. From the enchanted forest to the castle itself, all the background music fits exactly where you hear it. Whether it's swinging on vines over bottomless pits, or running from killer toys, this stuff feels right at home. Here are a few examples. There are a few areas where I feel Castle of Illusion could be better. While it certainly plays well enough, the game is overall short and easy. There are but five main stages and the first three of those go by like they're nothing. It's stage four before you hit any real challenge, but it's the kind of challenge that's based on quick deaths and your memory not to repeat them. In other words, you won't fall for them but once or twice before you move on. Once you get the feel for the butt bounce and chucking apples at enemies, you become a killing machine that easily walks through this one with nary a death to stop you. Even the last boss is a cakewalk once you see the super easy pattern she works within. The side effect of this ease of difficulty is that it becomes a perfect game to play with your kids. They should be able to tackle the first few stages with no issues at all, and even some of the later stages are tolerable. When it comes to your own entertainment, there is a hard setting you can play that makes things a bit tougher. You get some new enemy placements, platforms that are a bit harder to navigate, and fewer extra lives. If you think Castle of Illusion is too easy, this will definitely give you a bit more challenge. Overall, I really do think this game is one of Sega's better releases that year. It stepped away from Sega's usual hardcore sports and arcade grind and gave us something unexpected. Don't let the IP turn you away. Underneath that Disney exterior is an excellent looking and playing platformer. There are some folks out there that will tell you Castle of Illusion is overrated, that it simply isn't as good as Sega fans make it out to be. I disagree. I think this one was quite a big step for Sega as a developer. They took someone else's property, built a solid playing game around it, and set up what would become an excellent franchise of games. You really do have to put 1990 into perspective. Sega was growing a new brand and they needed software. They released sports games, arcade ports, and gritty action titles that they had been known for. Castle of Illusion was a breath of fresh air within that group of usual suspects. It was a welcome addition and one I'll always fondly remember. A short while after, Sega also dropped an 8-bit version of Castle of Illusion that was arguably just as good. It wasn't a port either. It had new gameplay and stage design that made it its own experience. It too was a great looking game visually. The Mega Drive version was so well received in Japan, Sega released it in a Sega Ages pack for the Sega Saturn. It was paired with Quackshot and is one of the few Saturn Sega Ages releases to be based on console games. In 2013, Sega and Disney decided to remake Castle of Illusion for a bunch of devices. Using 3D polygonal graphics, it touched up existing stage design and added a bunch new areas and enemies to the mix. You can still get it for the Xbox One and Xbox Series X through backwards compatibility. The 1990 Genesis game will always have a special place in my heart. Not only was it part of my early days with the platform, but it was also further proof that judging a game by its cover simply wasn't good enough. Every game deserved a chance, and if you are a fan of Sega's fourth generation entry, this one is something you just gotta play. I'm Sega Lord X. thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.